Kia ora no te whare. Kia ora, kia ora tātou. Can you all hear me? Oh, good. that's good. My name is Mark Kōpua, and... Uh, and my name is Matthew Pinnell. Just so you didn't get it wrong. Because <laughs> sometimes I introduce myself as Derek Lardelli. <laughs> and I definitely don't look like Diana Kōpua. I come from a little town uh, just north of a uh, farming town, uh, just north of Tolaga Bay. You would think that I would say that I come from Tolaga Bay. Yes, I come from Tolaga Bay, but I actually, in my heart, like uh, the previous Potoko was talking about Fenua Kite Fenua, but my heart and my wairua is in a piece of land called Mangatuna. And Kotakun Pito Te Ao is in another small place called Manutuke. Oh, kia ora manatuke. I raru i te maru o rongo whakata. That's on my mother's side, and on my dad's side, I'm from Whakatohia. Ooh, oh. gee. I was just trying to visualise the anatomy of a person and find out where manatuke really was. <laughs> so because I'm from Wangatuna, I'm from Ngāti Kaukura Nui, that's one of my hapu, and also from Ngāti Afia. That's another one of my hapu, and the two tribes that they're affiliated with are Te Aitanga Hawiti and Ngatira. I didn't grow up in Gisborne, though. My parents had to meet, move from Oportski in Gisborne as part of the urban drift, so I was actually brought up in Wellington, in the hood called Timberley, and it provided a really good upbringing for myself. But it was since probably the age five of when my name was Matthew that my mother started to decolonise our family and from that point, I was known as Matthew. And I've always been Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but I became a social worker. But then it made me think about all my life, my parents were my social workers. And, and, I, and I grew up in a background of Māori tanga. I was raised by my grandparents. Those, those were my parents. And my kotahi te reo i roto i to, to matauwhare was reo Māori. In fact, I was telling my colleagues uh, this morning that uh, he went out, he went to Sky City last night, he grabs that opportunity. <laughs> and I said, you know, my, my father had very bad English and the only association I had with, with, with gambling was that I was his translator over the phone to the TAB when he wanted to. <laughs> 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 and so... But I grew up in that, in that environment, on our marae, taken to all the land block meetings. I had no idea where the hell, you know. And, but on the way, going to the land block meeting was being told about this piece of land, that piece of land, and so forth. And of course, when I take Diana on a tour up to Tairawhiti, she hates it because she has no recollection of any of those sorts of things. Uh, but that's all the stuff that's been stored in me and gathered and accumulated over the years, and I only ever lived in Wellington for a short period of time. But even then, that background made me curious and interested in all the landscape and all the history of even Wellington while I was living there. And, so him, and of course, I'm connected because Ngāti Ira were there before, before Te Ateawa. So, <laughs> I know that, um, speaking of landscape of the whare, and I know that us as practitioners, social workers, clinical specialists, and all that sort of stuff, are really good at assumptions, and are really good at assu assuming things. And I'm thinking, when you present, you want to know what impact do you want to make. And I'm thinking that these people, maybe in the front row, have the checkbooks. Hence the reason that, that, that we're strategically placed here. But anyway, Fano, <laughs> I know Ashley Bloomfield's the goal, eh? Anyway, Fano, what we're here today is, is to talk about um, mahi atua in terms of the way of being. Um, yeah, Mark's going to give you... I might give you a brief whakapapa about where this come from. So Diana, my wife Diana, uh, uh, grew up in a mental health service, not as a recipient of mental health, but as a nurse. So she grew up in the service called Te Whare Marie, and she went for a one-year... Uh, full immersion course, and in that full immersion, one of the things that they talked about for Motereo, one of the things they talked about was Atua Māori. And this experience for her caused her to almost feel her wairua was elevated. 
And so she thought, gee, with all the people that I work with, let's try and see if I use that same corridor with them, will that elevate their, their wairua? And of course it did, as you, you, you can imagine, because talking about atua Māori and so forth is really talking about your connection with the land, like the previous speaker and myself talked about, the wairua inside me is from the land down here. So that type of thing was about elevating wairua. So she developed it and started using it in her practice. But as we all know when we we experience it, when we sit in meetings and mental health services, the real mana, the only voice, is there with the doctor and is there with the psychologist. And I, when I got into mental health, it was that, that was my experience too. The doctor and the psychologist had all the voice in our meetings. And so Diana decided, bugger it, I'm going to go and become a doctor. So she became a doctor, she became a psychiatrist, and then, of course, we ended up developing um, Mahi Atua even further. We started taking, we took it home to the Taira Fiji, and we, we then, of course, developed it into uh, different, different types of things. Uh, Mahi Atua has been different types of things. It was a model, it was an approach. You can use it as an assessment. You can use it in, as a framework, all sorts of different things. But for most of us who are, who are experienced in the Mahi Atua training delivered by Kuruna, who are now Matora. How many of you are in here Matora? Come on, Patrick, put your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then you know that it's about being a way of being. That's why the, the title is Mahiatua, a way of being. Because as a practice, you can deliver that as a tonga that you gift to your people that you're working with. But you've also got to worry about the people that we, you're working with in terms of yourself and your colleagues. Because often, we're, going, we're experiencing burnout and, and all sorts of crap that's going for us at work. And the next minute, the violence becomes horizontal. It doesn't have much here. Hi. <laughs> and the whakapapa of, of being a matora, I guess, is, is the pūrāko in regards to matora. So matora was an ariki that went through transformation and change. And one of the changes that was most influential to him was his um, environment. And just like whenua ki te whenua, it made me think of puna ki te puna, tipuna ki, ta, ki ngā mukapuna, tupuna ki ngā mukapuna. And that umbilical cord or umbilical cord connection from our past to our future and our present. And when we talk about being matora, and I saw kahurangi, your, your hand was the very first one to go up before you even finished the word matora. But um, Matora is very much, it has been um, in terms of supporting our whānau that are in distress and a different approach and a different way of being, but it's, almost, it's, always, it's also been part of a critical mass. And um, I think we've all been victims of systematic type stuff and, and inoho tatapu, um, which was restriction. Um, and having a, a critical mass enables us to to hungi hungi te whewhei and, and speak more freely and look for different options of moving forward. So the way of being that we speak about is really um, acquired and maintained by the three principles of mahi atua. And when the stuff that you study in mahi atua or in the wānanga helps you, because I want to make this quite clear that, that uh, the, the, the announcement that, uh, that the ministry made about Te Ku Wata Wata talked about kaupapa Māori approach and whānau approach. But in actual fact, the foundation of Te Ku Wata Wata and Te Hiringa Matua is based on Mahi Atua. And that's a slightly different thing, because most of us that work in, in a Māori approach, in a Māori way, in a Māori way, and we use kaupapa Māori to deliver whatever it is that we're using to deliver, we also got getting smashed up against the racism within the space that we worked, right? So we've got we to deal with all that. So Mahi Atua exposes you to, to how to identify, and most of us can, how to identify racism, how to talk about inequity, what's the difference between equity and, and quality, uh, all those sorts of issues that are going to create or look like uh, resistance to bringing kaupapa Māori into our space. So just to be clear that it wasn't just kaupapa Māori that 
was the success that, that created the, the vast increase in outcomes, the vast increased uh, uh, connection with Fano and the tight outfit. It was my Atua that did that because it's more than just Kopapa Māori. Get the bike, am I making sense there? So, uh, so we, have, we have these three principles, and Matthew's already talked with one called Hongi Hongi Te Fei Feia, and it is extremely the hardest one for us, for all of us, to get a grip with. But on our slideshow, that's going to be the third. So don't <laughs> explain Hongi Hongi Te Fei Feia. <laughs> We're gonna stick to the. That's how you hold me to pay for yeah. He just give me. <laughs> he just gave me some feedback. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so our first, our first principle, Fano. It's on the, it's on the, it's on the slide, and it's called Ten Te Po No Mai Te Ao. So it's indigenising the space we occupy. What that space looks like is <coughs> specific and special to every individual in the, in, in, in this room. It um, could, it could, it could be in here. That's the space that you, that you indigenise. And it's great because if you indigenize the space, that you don't have to worry about decolonizing mm -hmm. your space. Because de to decolonize, you can actually use in indigenize to do that. Mm. And I guess from w working from a whānau, whānau centric point of view, indigenizing a space is using different language. So when we're using different language, and we're not pathologizing whānau. Like an example might be looking at schizophrenia. As opposed to psychotic episodes, yeah, all that that sort of language yeah. that actually, uh, you know, um, stigmatizes our, our whānau. Mm. That's our whānau. I heard yesterday that already in the Māori caucus there's an idea, or a fantastic idea, to change the word from whaiora to tangata whenua. Mm. That's fantastic because it actually shifts the way that we're thinking, and that's one of the things about Mahiatu is to shift the lens that we're using. Not necessarily change it, but to shift it, to shift it in any direction, to create shifts, to create change. Yeah. And some of the really small things make a big difference, like instead of client or patient, we, we, call, them, we call them whānau. If we th you think about the schizophrenia, we think about rangirua or mahirang, mahirangi, and, and, and um, liken that momo to Maui. Like he was hianga, really unexplained behaviour, like he, he, um, he took all the, all the um, flames from Mahuika. He um, took his father's jawbone. Unexplainable things because he was curious. And sometimes when people are going through a psychotic episode or in rangirua and are really, really uncertain of themselves, they're in a different space. So it's about, about us not normalising it, but just not pathologising it. So tēnei te pō, no mai te ao. It's not for us to really tell you how to do that because like I said, is that every individual has a different whakaro on indigenising the space that you occupy. And, and they can be small changes, so one of the changes, well this is actually considered a big one, is that at Te Kuwata Wata, for example, as well as at, at uh, Te Hiringa Matua, we've stopped working in, in, as individuals. We now have co-working co uh, groups which we call ue, uh, and we work as an ue. Because when you're working as an individual, then you can hide your practice. Who's telling you whether you did a good job in that last nohonga or not? It's your co-worker that's going to tell you that, gee, you talked a bit harsh with that fellow there a little bit, didn't you think? And you're taking that, then you have to sit and, and believe and, and take on board hongi hongi te whaiwhaiā, which is to inhale that negative feedback. Like breathe it in. <laughs> which also comes on to our, uh, our second principle, which is um, kamate ariki kamate tauira, and, is, and it is remaining an active learner even in the space when we're supporting our whānau in distress. Like, um, I, I, I think going on the, on the previous kōrero was um, complex cases, and I'm wondering, complex to who? Mm. Mm. Us as practitioners? because we're not being effective or we're not even being curious. So complexity is in the people that occupy in the room. Like sometimes it's just a matter of our whānau have a breakdown in their network. And their network can go back a long way. That's why I loved how our whānau come up here all together. He wānanga tērā. They're all in the space of wānanga to work through their distress with themselves. 
So one of the things about kamate ariki, kamate tauira, as it pre, as it pre, as 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 practitioners or kaimahi, we are perceived to be the experts in the room. This almost flips it on its head and reiterates that the whānau are the experts in the room. We are the matora, supporting and facilitating our whānau through that change. So yeah, can you add to that? Oh, it's just fantastic listening to you. <laughs> I was waiting for you to cut me off. In terms of being an active learner, anyway, I must have missed the memo of the jandals. <laughs> Maria told me you better not wear jandals, Matt, and now you're up here with jandals. Hongi hongi te whei whei you're going to breathe. <laughs> Yeah, not, reacting, not reacting, not <laughs> reacting. Yeah. Kuira, kuira te fakaro te nei kamate ariki kamate tawira. And and firo firo te tipua, um, I guess is that is um, you know when something sits in your puku, and you and you want to and you want to respond and and you're you're in a space where I'm the expert, the firo te tipua is the atua that is telling you, sitting on your shoulder, in terms of, yes you are, don't listen to them, carry on. Yeah. And if we look at this, this picture, Fido um, has a ngangara, and some of the ngangaras are our own barriers, our own personal barriers that we hold. Um, so you can see that one there consuming his head. Consuming yeah, his consumes thoughts. your mind. Yeah. And of course one of the things about that, when your head, mind is consumed in a fixed state, they call it fixed mindset. And we want to try and shift people to a growth mindset so that they're always looking for potential. They're always trying to learn. They're always trying to grow. They're always trying to develop and enhance their practice or even just themselves personally. So that's, 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 a, that's the whole idea of kamate ariki, kamate tawira. And it's taken from one of our karakia, uh, that, that tawhito. And one of the things about Mahiatu is also that it is there to indigenize a space by in deeply embedding Matauranga Māori pre-colonization. Pre because there's no other spaces that we have to, to enable us to do that. All right? Normally we go into a, a space and they would say, this is normal, that they would say, we need to start our hui with a karakia. And we start our hui with our karakia and it's almost like instinctive. E tō mātou matu i te rangi. Nō tā wahi ke te nā karakia. Now, we are trying to say we need to indigenize the space and so we're going to say tēnei te aro rangi nui e tuaka nei tēnei te aro papa tūna koe takatone. Alright? So that's, that's part of indigenizing the space and, and creating space for that indigenous, indigenous Mataranga Māori to grow. Kabai? Moving on to our third, our third principle is hungi hungi te whaiwhaia. So it's embracing negative feedback for means to grow. Some people call it constructive feedback and it's the same saying, but you know, negative, negative has a more, a, a more powerful slang to it in terms of punch. But knowing that negative feedback is coming from a, a place of growth or wanting to grow, it can be referred to as a koha. If someone gives you a koha, hey, I noticed you've done this sort of thing, which almost aligns with um, why at Taku Wata, Wata we co-work. So when we co-work, we work in twos because it makes us accountable for each other in terms of when we're working for our whanau. Usually we work by ourselves, but if we're talking again about embracing negative feedback, who's to tell us that we're doing a good job with the whanau that we're working with? Who's and to tell us that we're not doing a good job with the whānau that we're working with? And the secret with the co-working is that, and I'm sure most of us here have, have worked co-worked before, uh, but the secret of the co-working is that one will sit in the, in the, in the session or the nohonga as a modi for mm. us to ensure that the other one who's facilitating is always knows I've got, that person has my back, but that person is also going to criticise me if I screw something up in here. All right, so sometimes we have this tendency to say, you should be this, you should be that, you should be this. So when it's done, or even while the whānau are sitting there, our modi will step in and say, hang on, hang on, should you, you should be doing that? You should be talking to them as opposed to trying to work with them to get by him? So that's, that's why we co-work, so that we're always checked, but we always somebody there has our back. Hey, Pai? One of, Works. 
one of the things with Hongi Hongi Te Fei Fei uh, also is it's learning from your feedback, but making it's okay to stuff up. Because one of the most important responses that you can give someone is not the biomedical response, it's a human response. So if you're there given a human response and you're not perfect, not aiming to be perfect, but failing successfully, then in, as long as you learn the next time, the whānau will appreciate that. And of course, you know, to feel good about stuffing up, is, is, it's good when you stuff up because you learn from each experience. And when we, you know, when we share the story about Tane, Tane Mahuta separating Ranginu and Papa Tūnuku, he didn't do it straight away, first pop. He, first of all, he tried to use flax, flax to lift the sky up. So that was his first failure. Then he tried to use a pity pity tree. That was going to be a failure. And eventually, all these screw-ups that he made until he got to the actual tree, the kauri and the tōtara, to actually elevate the sky to where they wanted it to be. So it's, it teaches us that screwing up or is you should make a great, you know, fail with absolute success. <laughs> and hongi hongi te whaiwhaiā, just grab a hold of it and hug it. Like that. <laughs> Feel the wairua of that success because that, sucks, that wairua is going to help you improve from each, each step forward. Ka pai? Te ku wata wata is an atua that occupies the island Pōtererangi. And Pōtererangi is, is between Te Aotūro, so a place, uh, a place of hostility, anger, chaos. war, chaos, chaos. And it's the gateway into a place called Rarohenga, which is the opposite to that. Love, peace, tranquility. Um, and so that's why we, we, um, we named or got the name to Ku Wata Wata for that service because it's the, it's the ED of mental distress in the Tairawhiti. So it's the first door that you, that you go to and then from that point onwards they tell you whether you're going to go to x-ray or they're going to, you know, that kind of thing, but for mental health and, yeah. and addictions. And so hence we, we uh, looked at Tuku Wata Wata as a name for, for that um, service. Uh, so because that, our, so our puraka, our mātauranga Māori, uh, reflects what it is that we're trying to do and we're trying to follow and indigenise that space by using it. Not only that, but at Tuku Wata Wata, when you walk in, you, you would be correctly thinking that it looks like a gallery, a Māori art gallery, and that's exactly what it is. It's also that as well. Uh, so that your first initial appearance it doesn't, doesn't uh, drive you back into your cave. The idea is to bring you there to be more welcoming, and our young girls that sit, sit at the, in, in the reception are wonderful. They'll offer you... Uh, the registration form along with a coffee and a tour of all the art that's in the whare, so that it is far more welcoming, as was Taku Wata Wata in his task of greeting the whānau as they came on their journey through from the chaos to peace. Edpai? I'm looking at our timer. There's not much time left, sort of. So what we, we might skip a few things. A lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of the time, is, is you, you'll see slides here, and a lot of our atua have momo, just like our whānau. They come in with, yes, they come in, well, they don't necessarily come in with behaviours, they come in with momo, which is part of their personality, or sometimes it's about us being curious of the whakapapa of that momo. And, I, and I've heard the word inter, in, intergenerational trauma, he the whakapapa of that. So it's looking, looking back to determine what we do moving forward. Often we have children that come through because it's not a, just a youth service and it's not just a drug and alcohol and addiction service. It's, it covers the whole thing. And so often we've had children that have been diagnosed elsewhere with ADHD or some sort, form like that and they come into to this service and when they come out of their wānanga that they've had with the, with the mātāora and the clinician, he'll walk up to Dad and go, Dad, yeah, I'm a god. <laughs> and Dad's like, he's, he's like, really? <laughs> yep, I'm a god. Which god? Ue Poto. <laughs> and Dad's like, never heard of that god. Who is Ue Poto? And that, now we're starting to indigenize our space. We've got this child who's no longer stigmatized, who's no longer diagnosed, who's 
all that sort of thing. And he's actually proud of his behavior because it's now being not labeled as ADHD, which is a problem, but it, now he's being called God. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking uh, of Uwe Poto, Mark is going to share Puraka. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and our Puraka today is, um, it's called Inho Tatapu. So it's, it's at a time when, actually you're sharing it. Go, you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, right at the beginning, when Ranginui and Papa Tūnu could meet each other, it was in a time period known as Te Pō, the great darkness, or the darkness. They met each other, it's like we, we, we that's when mum and dad met each other in the dark. <laughs> and that's where we met our loved one in the dark. And so these two met each other in the dark, when they fell deeply in love, so in love that they wouldn't let each other go. And of course, when you're in that state of darkness and, and, and love and, and won't let your, your partner go, oh, you're going to create a lot of children. And so they did create a lot of children, lots and lots and lots of them. But the trouble was that the children couldn't escape from that embrace of love that the parents had for each other. And eventually for eons and eons, and the periods of time changed. They went from the darkness, which you could probably call for Rangi and Papa as the happy darkness. And then it became the long darkness. And then the great, great huge darkness. And then the deep darkness. And it carried on and on and on until we get to the point where all these kids that are stuck in this darkness, there's one of them called Kekerewai, he says to the one next to him, because remember, it's dark. Who are you? <laughs> and that one next to him said, I'm Toro Iwaho. I'm the god of networking. <laughs> and Kekerewai said, perfect, I need to network this information. What's that information? I'm sick of this world that we live in. I'm tired of it. It's dark, it's cold, it's wet, and it's too confining, too restricting. And in the Itareo Māori, i noho means to exist, tata, close, close together, pū, in a group. But from that sentence, i noho tata pū ngā atua, comes the word tapu. And so this whole idea of sacredness is post-colonization uh, post notion of tapu. Tapu comes from this corridor in Noho Tatapu. Kabai? So they were stuck in this whole idea, and a discussion started because he's Torohi Waho, the god of networking. So he's going to spread, the god of gossip. <laughs> he's going to spread it out there, and of course, all of them started. And then Fido, the guy with the dragon over his head, says, hey, 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 cut it out. <laughs> we're all right. I like the darkness. I'm the god of the darkness. I'm a god of fear and I'm a god of evil, you know, d disease, <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, during all this corridor, another god, the ADHD god, <laughs> Uwe Poto, he spots this little light, uh, much like that one, that's, that's blinding me slightly <laughs> over there. <laughs> but he spots this little light and he can't take his eyes off it. And so he nudges, who's this? He nudges this person on the left, and that person was called the Mamaru. That person, my, my wife always growls me for that. That Atua was called the Mamaru. And so Uweputo says, you see that little light up there? And the Mamaru says, yeah, 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 that's in mum's armpit. Strange place for a light to come from, but... <laughs> <clears throat> she must have been holding her iPhone under here. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, uh, that's a... And then so Tamamaru then nudges the one next to him called Peketu, and there's a minute the three of them. And in the meantime, Firo's going, hey, 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 I've already told you, fellas. Stop, stop this conversation about the discomfort. And now you three stop talking about that damn light. Just, just ignore it. Just ignore it. It's nothing. And, of course, that light was called the Hinatori. And the hina tore means the white tore. Think about that one. <laughs> the white tore. And my wife always says, that's why you men keep looking at us vaginas. Because <laughs> that's where the light comes from. <laughs> so this light is called the hina tore, but the hina tore 
is the glow from a glow worm. Where did they first light? Not the wild, the poor. And so, these three, now that they've created this uh, mass, this critical mass, they're no, no longer bothered about Firo and his growly voice, his bullying sounding voice. And so they're just totally focused on this light. And Firo says, Uepoto, if you do not stop looking at that light, I'm going to curse you. And Uepoto thought, <laughs> I thought I'd just throw that one in there. <laughs> And he carried on towards that light, and the curse that was inflicted upon him was called goosebumps. And so that's when, how we know this, this is real. <laughs> <laughs> I know that part was might have been real. <laughs> and so that's, what, that's uh, the goosebumps uh, origin, is from this curse. And then Firo, it didn't stop Uepoto, he kept moving towards the light. And so Firo reached over to Tamamara, he went to grab Tamamara to pull him back like this, and all he could grab was his hair, and he ripped his hair back, and suddenly Tamamari was bald. And this is the origin of baldness, Fano. <laughs> <coughs> For those of us who are bald. And then he threw his hair up, and the hair ended up in the clouds, woven as a, as a fluffy mat of clouds, and Tamamari became a potirio that looks after the clouds that's up there. Hence, he's called Tamamaru or the white covering. Have I so that's that. And then the last one was that he turned Peke to into a centipede. So those are the origins of those certain things. Nevertheless, he then started, this fiddle, then started to turn his attention towards that light and said, if I can't change you fellas, remember this, that's a glow worm. If I can't change you fellas, then I'm going to destroy that light. And as he went to approach that light to destroy it, Tane, our hero, normally the hero, steps in front of him and he said, bro, the only way that I know you can destroy that tiny speckle of light is to flood it with absolute light, with more light. So for Fido, he's saying, the only way that I can see you changing or getting rid of your fear of that light is to be, is to, is to absolutely overwhelm yourself with light, with your fear, like that. So that's the story about Noho Tatapu and where it went to, and that, of course, then shifted that the conversation became about separating the parents and moving themselves, ten eight the poor, no might tell, shifting from the darkness into the light. Kabai? Tell your mother on an hour. And Fano, that's how, that, that's how we wananga with Fano. We, we were wondering before this, um, we thought everyone might be sitting at tables and we were like, turn to your mate and get in, this, get in the group. And we looked at the room tonight and we thought, that ain't going to happen. We thought about getting yeah, these we, all in a big circle. Yeah, we were, all, <laughs> we were t t discussing, oh, I want 14 groups. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be absolute chaos, I know that. Mm, mm. <laughs> but, so the, the slides that we've been going through are all different atua. And I guess we've stopped on this one because sometimes when we, when we do... Uh, Shira Pudaka with the Fano and, 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 and the Wananga is coming to a close. We do a thing called Hineko Oro here. And Hineko Oro here is out to a reflection. And one, of the, and, and one of the things why we do Hineko Oro here with the Fano, because it is very much so about not talking about the Fano without the Fano. So normally, we would say, Kia ora for the Wananga, ka kite, see you next week. Then me and Mark would make a plan for the Fano. Yeah, that, actually, what happens many times is that we get like, oh, God of gossip. And all we do is gossip about the whanau, yeah. that type of thing. And um, I don't know your fellow's experiences, but in my experiences, MDTs are really gossip sessions. Mm. And we tend, to, we tend to, that's our opportunity because they're no longer there. Let's diss their behaviour. That, that type of thing goes on. If you want to change that, bring them into the MDT. So that's why we no longer have MDTs. We have in our kaoro here. And all that is done honestly uh, uh, and briefly Without, uh, without suggesting or coaching them to what they should do, mm. but reflecting about what our ideas are, what, our, what we're wondering, so that they're listening and then they join in. So some of those... They become part of the plan as opposed to an object of treatment. Yeah. Have I? And some of those things are just changing the language. Like when we say things like, 
I'm curious, or I'm wondering, it's okay to be wrong? Because you're, you, you're just being curious. Yeah, you are just being curious in that space. And then once we've had our reflection, we, we ask the whanau, give us some feedback on what you agreed with, what you didn't, and just how you found that process. A lot of the times the feedback is like, oh, I was pretty uncomfortable, never had that done before. But it's shown, uh, it's shown the whanau that we can be vulnerable in that space as well. And we're not always perceived as the expert, and we, all, and we always do have the tendency to not hit it right on, um, hit, hit on the button. Yeah. And, and often too, like we have, a, it has a format. So we do acknowledgement. So I really would like to uh, acknowledge the whanau and thank the whanau for coming in and showing such brave, bravery because to bring that heavy kaupapa that they have that's burdening them into this whanau must, be, must feel quite exposing and vulnerability is all, all part of it. So I have to acknowledge that. And I must also acknowledge my own feelings. And this is me doing a kaupapa here. Right? I've got to acknowledge my own feelings. I was a little bit nervous because that's a heavy cope of about a person who's had two failed attempts and he's at high risk of suiciding again. Uh, I'm quite nervous about that because, uh, shit, I just really don't know what to do at the moment. You know what I mean? So you're really, really exposing. I wonder, I wonder what it would be like if Dad had come in. I mean, I know Dad was, is the perpetrator. But it would be interesting to get Dad's perspective and to really have Dad here to hold him to account. You follow what, follow what, what, what happens in Hinakaura here? So it's not gossiping because they're sitting right there. And then that provokes something in them to become part of the plan as opposed to the object of treatment. Kapai? I'm wondering if my babble just then really evoked something in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Fano, we've only got a couple of minutes, and um, we're wondering if you want to ask any questions to Mark. Yeah. Real easy ones. Yeah. <laughs> got these things as well. Oh, right. That? Are those yeah. question things? I've got to ask a question because we just. Oh, yeah. See? Get yep. to speak into it. Oh, wow. Oh, that's a question. Oh, wow. Right. Is that one of the gifts that we get for... <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll just do a couple of questions. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora. I'm, I'm Ed from Odyssey. How are you going? I've just got a question. Thank you very much. A question around whether... Um, uh, uh, I don't know what the phrase to use, but a non co Māori service, such as Odyssey, whether um, an approach like this could be used by them. And I'm also interested in your thoughts about whether something like this could work in uh, um, somewhere like a prison, which was the very kind of walls of the place kind of represent colonization. And um, how do you indigenize an environment like that? Uh, one of the things about Te Ku Wata Wata, even though it has a Māori name, it's a mainstream service, but just uses a Māori lens uh, at interest. But it is a mainstream service. It's the front door for mental health distress in the Tairawhiti. So definitely, it's, it, uh, the whole idea and the notion here is to not separate the two, because working as a, as a co-working, we're hopefully that you can have a mata order that's sitting in this room, as well as, a, uh, as your clinician. But that the mata order is in this kaupapa Māori land service that's mainstream, is the facilitator. So that for Māori whānau, there's that connection that happens. Because when you talk about, uh, it's a service about mātauranga Māori, most of our services, whether they're mainstream or not, have been up to the eyeballs in mātauranga Māori, but there's been resistance like racism that stops that becoming the main lens that we look through at distress and how do we understand that distress. Uh, things, our focus has been on diagnosis. Our focus has been on what's the risk. I'm so sick of that word, the risk. What is the risk? The opposite to risk is connection. We have those little mantras that, that allow us to, um, to validate nannies. We want to employ nannies just to be a nanny, not to be a nurse or not to be anything else. Because sometimes when we can't engage with young children or rangatahi because of whatever uepoto thing got, they got happening for them, so sometimes it's the nanny 
that is able to engage with this mogopuna. Right, so it's acknowledging and indigenizing the space that way. By acknowledging that in Mataranga Māori, we had a system. What did we do before there were psychiatrists? Nanny. That was... <laughs> You know, Manutuke, where he comes from, they've already said to me, oh, our camp service was Nanny Iris. <laughs> if you played up, you went down to Nanny Iris. They soon sorted you out. <laughs> but that's, we, we laugh about that because, you know, we know that those nannies exist and they, they straighten us out. That type of thing. Why can't they be part yep. of our services? No different to, okay, let's find a matakite. Phew. We've got time for one more question. All right, sorry. <laughs> Carl? Choice. Kumatu. Kia ora tātou.